You know that I'm talking about the delivery of the Christ child, Jesus Christ, Mary's firstborn. And the firstborn experience is really great, can be almost traumatic at times. People have many different experiences when they've had their children. I remember distinctly each time, each of three times, that Christy told me it is time to go. Time to go to the hospital. One time, Christy attended a communion service, and after the communion service, the love feast and communion on Sunday night, that Sunday night was time to go. So we went into the hospital. I remember with our first son, we rushed all the way down to Cumberland, Maryland, because they weren't delivering babies in Petersburg at that time. So she said it's time to go and rushed down to Cumberland, Maryland. Indeed, I thought it was going to take longer for the gentleman to push her in a wheelchair from the car to the delivery room than it took us to get to Cumberland, Maryland. It just seemed like he went so slow. And then let me tell you just briefly about when Aaron was being born. And at that time, they began to let fathers be in the delivery room with the mother. So I was there with, with my wife during the birth of each of my three sons. I thought I was so good at it, I could just start delivering babies. But while Aaron was being born, and they were telling her to push, I was helping her, and I was pushing so much that I pushed the table halfway across the room, and the nurse said, it's her that needs to push and not you. <laughs> I remember that. And then the doctor was checking for Aaron's heartbeat. You know, they put the little thing right on her tummy to listen to the heartbeat of the baby. Well, he put it there. There was no heartbeat. He moved it around. There's no noise on the machine. Well, I'm looking at this, you know, and thinking, this is not good. No noise. And the doctor shook his head like this. And in a second's time went through my mind, oh my goodness, the baby is not alive. There's no noise. And then when the doctor shakes his head, what are you going to think? And then he said, these machines never work right. <laughs> and he said, bring up another one. <laughs> well, at least I had some hope at that point that was all okay. We eagerly anticipated the birth of a baby child. One time we just drove from the house to Petersburg. So we had a baby born in Maryland. We had a baby born in West Virginia. And we had a baby born in Virginia. One fellow told me, well, you've only got 57 more states to go. <laughs> <laughs> By comparison, it's hard to imagine the journey from Nazareth to Judea and on to Bethlehem. And who would believe that a Savior would be born in Bethlehem? An obscure place. And yet, God had designed that that is where the child would be born. And not only had he designed that that was where the child would be born, he also designed exactly how they would get to Bethlehem. Even though the events seem unrelated. Listen, God works details of things out in our lives that we might not realize are related to the very purposes and plans of God in our life. Even details that might be a challenge. God does not mind to put us through some challenging times as it fits 
into what he's doing in the overall picture of our lives. Micah 5, 2. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judea, but out of thee he shall come forth even unto me that is to be ruler in Israel. Prophesied hundreds of years before Christ was born. It was given that he would be born in Bethlehem. Well, I'd like to read Luke's account, which remember, we believe that Mary probably gave him this through her speaking to him, an oral account of what happened there. I might mention that as Mary might have described these things to Luke and he wrote them down, there's no mention of the hardship that she could have had in the journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem. I think we all try to wonder what that journey was like. It was quite a distance. I might mention that there's no mention of Mary riding on a donkey in Scripture. That's all right. We often have a donkey there, and we might even have a picture of Mary riding on the donkey, and, and it, maybe she did. It just doesn't say it in Scripture. And it doesn't say that there were three wise men either. <laughs> all those things we kind of pick up. Let's read what Luke did write. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole empire should be registered or taxed. This first registration took place while Quirinius was governor in Syria. That gives us some historical perspective. So everyone went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family line of David. And by the way, so was Mary. To be registered along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was pregnant. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son. How much is written in a single sentence? She gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in snugly in cloth and laid him in a feeding trough, or the King James Version says, a manger because there was no room for them in the end. Caesar Augustus, he was controlled by God. The heart of the king is in the Lord's hands, and he turns it as he will. Kings don't know that they are being controlled by God, but they are. He was concentrating on his taxes, and as the Bible says, in one place, I believe, that the whole, here it says the whole empire. In the King James, I believe it says the whole world. Caesar Augustus, which is not his uh, real name, but a taken name of honor that he acquired. He would have taxed the whole world if he could. Now, when it says the whole world in the scripture, it means the whole known world. There were people, of course, outside of their empire that was not included. But Augustus wanted to be like a god of deity. And in trying to be almost like a god himself, he missed the god that was born that night. But at the same time, he had a part in placing Mary and Joseph in Bethlehem. It seemed like just a coincidence that at that time, Caesar Augustus did this. But the whole population now was on the move. Thousands of people were moving from one place or another as all of them were going back to the place of their lineage. Just like here, Joseph. Because he was of the house and family of David, he would go back 
to that area and to Bethlehem. And perhaps thousands were traveling at that time. And that might have been the reason, for instance, that we see there that there was no room for them in the inn. The inn was full. Oh, by the way, the Bible doesn't say anything about an innkeeper. It says there's no room for an inn. Now, we, uh, in the inn, but we, we like to add that individual maybe to our Christmas plays, and we want to think of him as a grumbly old man that just throws them out and says, you can't stay here and all that. But the Bible really doesn't include uh, much detail about that. Just says there's no room. So then we see that they found a place in what we often call a stable. Their stable was a good bit different than the stables that or barns that we might have. Probably not built of wood. Probably more like a cave. I don't know what the feeding area or the New King James calls it a feeding trough. The regular, the King James Version calls it a manger. I'm not sure what it looked like. I know what mangers look like because I used to feed my sheep in the barn. Put the hay in the manger. I can almost picture a little baby being laid down after being wrapped up and laid down in the hay in this feeding area. And very crude, modest to say the least. It could have taken them several days to make this journey. They would have been very tired, I'm sure, and worn out. I can hardly imagine Mary, to the last term of her pregnancy, traveling, whether it was by foot or donkey, it doesn't really matter. It would have been a, a hard trip, and I find it curious that there is nothing in the Bible that would have come from Mary's lips to give how much of a challenge that was. It's sort of left for us to speculate. Both Joseph and Mary were of the house and lineage of David. The ultimate reason they had come to Bethlehem, the ultimate reason is because God wanted them to be there. Yes, the superficial reason was because they were participating in this sort of a synthesis in a way. God does multitudes of things that we likely do not connect in our lives to put us where he wants us. It can be a job or the absence of a job, the loss of a job. In my life, it was undoubtedly the loss of a job that was God putting me where he wanted me. Now, I didn't like that very well. When you get laid off from a job of over 10 years and that you assume that you'll probably work there, the most of your life and you like very well, you don't really consider that a blessing. You get laid off. I was on unemployment for six months. I didn't like that. I was milking cows just for a few. Now, I don't want to say anything against farmers. I complained over in Virginia about milking cows for a couple of weeks, and I got in trouble with all the dairy farmers. They said, yeah, we do that all the time. And I said, I know. God does things in our life that often we do not connect with his will for accomplishing things in our lives. Now, I don't know if we can figure these things out in the midst. In the, in the moment of my unemployment, I was depressed, upset, almost mad at God. Why is this? And when you were unemployed in the early 80s, it was not a very good scene. You couldn't buy a job anywhere. Probably it's a lot worse than it is now. You can get jobs now, it seems. The hour had come for Christ to be born, and a special delivery was about to happen, and Mary did give birth to a child. 
They were in a cave-like shelter. She laid in them in the manger, and just the thought of having a baby in a crude circumstance like that is almost unimaginable. If the Holy Spirit had a part in the conception of Jesus Christ, the child, then I have to believe that the Holy Spirit also had a part in the birth of the child, just as well, right there. And the account includes that he was wrapped in swaddling clothes. New King James calls it snugly in cloth, strips of cloth perhaps. It was a tense time when my sons were being born. Even though I believe that most of each of our, the birth of our sons was fairly normal. And routine even. I have to tell you that the morning after my first son was born. Well that night about four o'clock in the morning I went home from Cumberland. And the next morning was I believe Sunday morning. And I went back to the hospital. And when I went by the room where Christy was at I looked in the room. And I hardly knew her. She looked that much different pretty rough someone asked me how the birth of the baby went I said well it went pretty good I said I was helping her and my back hurt for two weeks so you know it was kind of rough <laughs> I can't imagine giving the birth in a cave with only two of them there the special delivery of Jesus Christ happened in that place and we like to believe it was a purely blessed event. And I'm sure it was. The world had no room for him to be born. And it's still a lot like that today. The world, for the most part, has no room for Christ. Our government has decided that mangers and other symbols of Christ cannot be displayed in public and public lands or around government buildings. Many times there's been a fight, you know, over a manger scene. Can it be put up on the courthouse grounds or not? Some places they say no. I don't know what it's like around here. I've hardly been a part of putting up manger scenes anywhere but on the church grounds. There is no separation clause in our U.S. Constitution. There's only a restriction of government interfering with religious activities. This separation of church and state has been derived from some other writings outside the Constitution and sadly has been taken to heart by some within our government. But worse than that is, is a special delivery received by an individual when they are invited to receive Christ as their Lord and Savior? That's a special delivery right there. The moment that someone hears the gospel message, this has been provided for you. Can you receive it? That's not just a special witness, a special message. It is a special ultimate delivery of the Christ child to every individual that hears it. Christ took the steps of being born as a baby to show his love for every human being. And so this Christmas, when we're thinking about all the celebrations we're going to do, and most of us put a good bit of plans in the Christmas dinner that we might share, you know, it's like that with Thanksgiving too and other holidays. Might we ask ourselves, do I have room for Christ in my life? Is there room? To receive the special delivery of Jesus Christ and his 
forgiveness of my sins? Do I have room to live my life in a way that includes the Christ? Now not a child, but now a crucified and risen Lord. Do I look to Christmas as that special delivery to me? Lord, you have given yourself to me. If we can have that attitude, I think Christmas becomes a whole different event than the world sees for the most part. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that I can be relatively sure that most, if not everyone here in the worship service has received Christ as their Lord and Savior. They have made room for you. And Lord, my prayer is that I can more increasingly make room for you in my life. I don't want there to be any contention that puts part of my life at variance with what Christ wants to do in my life. And so, Lord, show me where I can make more room for you and receive more special deliveries all the time of what Christ can do in my life. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.